So we've completed the analysis for the maximum likelihood receiver. Let's do the same thing for the maximum a posteriori uh, probability um, estimate. How does that change? Very similar to what we've seen with the uh, maximum likelihood. So the decision rule it looks very similar, except that now we have a multiplicative term, a weighting term, that weights our likelihood function. And this weighting term is the a priori probability. And if we look at the binary case, of course this uh, general uh, MRE um, equation gets uh, reduced to something quite simple. It's the probability that a 1 will be sent multiplied by the density function, the conditional density function, given that a 1 is sent. So we have the test statistic is shifted by mean A1. If it's greater than the weighting of the uh, zero, logical zero probability, a priori probability, by its density function. Of course, there was a factor of 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma, but it doesn't change the sense of the inequality, so we've gotten rid of that. So essentially, it looks like what we saw in the maximum likelihood, but now each term has a weighting associated, and that's the a priori, the additional information that's available to us. So let's look at our plot and what it would look like now for this uh, product. So the um, here we're multiplying by P0 and in the other case it's being weighted by uh, P1. So because of this weighting, let's say the 0 is more likely, it will be bigger. They're no longer the same. I mean they're both Gaussian but because of multiplying by this factor, one's going to be bigger than the other. One is more probable than the other. Of course, if they were equal probability, it would be multiply each one by a half, and we'd be back in our situation for the maximum likelihood. But for the map case, assuming they're not equal priors, we have uh, a difference here. And we can see that the intersection of the uh, two uh, curves no longer happens at the midpoint between the two. So it's a difference uh, when we introduce these weighting functions. So now let's put our threshold at this intersection point. Because the intersection point is what's really interesting. Because when is this equal to this? They're equal at this point. And so now if I make that intersection point to be my uh, threshold, in that case, I'm going to say, if it's bigger than the threshold, well, then that means that this product is bigger. If it's smaller than the threshold, that means that this uh, product is bigger. So for instance, if I have the same uh, test statistic value that I had in my previous example, it may be to the right of the midpoint between A0 and A1, but it's to the left of this new uh, intersection point uh, in this case, even though it's the same number for z. So if I look now, because I'm to the left of the um, uh, intersection, if I'm to the left of the, the uh, threshold that I will be using, that means that the blue value, the, uh, assuming a 1 was sent, is going to be lower than if a 0 was sent, and that's because the 0 is more likely. So the a, pri uh, the a priori information pushes me to tend to think, even though I'm on the wrong side of the midpoint, zero is so much more likely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hedge my bet <laughs> and say that a zero was sent anyway. So this is the difference between the maximum a posteriori probability um, rule or, or strategy and the maximum likelihood strategy. So here is my threshold, and because I'm to the left of my threshold, you know, the, the yellow choice is, is more like is, is the, uh, maximizes the a posteriori probability. So here's an interesting uh, case which was evaluated in an exam in 2013. Uh, I suppose that we have a tertiary communication system, that means I have three symbols, and I look here on the uh, axis here, I'm, I'm indicating the mean values of the um, likelihood function for these different um, symbols which could be sent. Symbol A, symbol B, symbol C. Um, 
So symbol B has mean of zero, symbol A has some positive mean, symbol C has a negative mean, a little bit more negative than the A. So the first question in the exam was, suppose that the a priori probability is the same for all three symbols. Where would I put uh, the threshold? And the next one, we say, suppose that symbol A is three times more likely than B or C. Where would I put the threshold then? Okay, so I'll, you can look at the solution online for these questions to get the exact, uh, exact manipulations. But let's just as a thinking process, um, how would we know the response to the first one? Suppose they're all equiprobable. There's no weighting. Well, I can think of this like the binary problem. Between A and B, if I have to decide between A and B, wh how, where, where would I put my threshold? Well, I would put it at the midpoint because they're equally probable. So here would be like one threshold. And if I was going to choose between B and C, you know, which would I choose? Uh, and it would be here. So the midpoints are going to determine the thresholds for equiprobable uh, symbols because um, essentially, we're going to say choose the closest one, right? Z is going to fall somewhere on this. And I know that my, um, my maximum likelihood rule is maximum likelihood says choose closest. That's the thing you have to remember, choose, choose closest. So if I'm anywhere, if I land here, well, the closest is going to be symbol C. If I land over here, the closest is going to be symbol A. And I could do that calculation of, you know, calculating the distance. But it's clear that if I use these two um, uh, thresholds, anything here, I should choose C. Anything in between, I should choose B. And anything after this last threshold, I should choose A. So these midpoints gives me an easy way to answer this question about choose the closest. If I'm over here, well, clearly I'm going to be closer to C than B. And A is even farther away than B, so definitely I'm closer to C. So this midpoint is enough for me to choose C. Now, when I'm in between the two, well, uh, in that case, this region is when I choose symbol B. And of course, beyond that, uh, symbol A. Now, when A is three times more likely, well, then I have to um, get a little more precise. For sure, it's going to move. This is no longer going to be these midpoints. There will be some other points that will be necessary. And, and what would they be? So if they were equiprobable, we would have these midpoint thresholds. And when we say that symbol A is more probable, if it's more probable, I'm going to want to just choose A more. It's not just going to be A for this and more. I'm going to I'm going to want to cheat and, and take more A's. So for sure, this threshold is going to move, and it's going to move to the left. How much? Well, you can look in the problem, and for the specific values, you can calculate how much it moves. So shifted threshold if A is three times more likely, but where exactly you have to calculate. So to summarize, we started looking at sampling receivers. We know that the signal is corrupted by added white Gaussian noise. We know because it's a sampling receiver, there's one number, the test statistic, which is going to be used to make our decision. And that decision, based on this test statistics, we have a couple of strategies that we've looked at. We've looked at the maximum likelihood and the MAP receivers. So, we today, so we've looked at the definitions, we've looked at the equations in the binary case, and uh, the next part that we have to address, now that we've sort of finished the part about the decision box, is um, what do we choose for our waveform? What shape do we use? Do we use a rectangle? Do we use something else? And, and what about our linear filter? How, how, what informs that choice of what the response should be? So we finished the detection part of the box, but we still have to look at the filtering part of the box.